John Shook and Vinny Natolo, who are going to share with us their perspective on meat. We talked last week about vegetable texture and the concept of um, starting to get into elasticity, and that's the theme of the week. There's no better way to start to understand more about elasticity and the texture of foods that we eat through meat. And so this is one of John and Vinny's prime specialties. They're chefs and owners of the restaurant Animal and also Son of a Gun here in Los Angeles. The authors of cookbook Two Dudes, One Pan and have also been named by Food and Wine as the um, best young chefs in America. So um, we're in for a treat as you can um, see they brought along some of their um, assistance as well. And uh, without further ado, um, please let's welcome John and Vinny. Thanks so much. I'm John, this is Vinny. There's nothing better than going after the world's best chef. First they called us and they said you should come lecture at UCLA. We were totally game and then you know we figured you guys would have some build up and by the time it was our turn. Uh, we would kind of just entertain you and give you some good food. <laughs> then all of a sudden we heard that Renee canceled on his first section and that he was going to be going before us here, and that's when we got nervous. <laughs> <laughs> Until then, we were pretty good. So we're going to do nothing but disappoint you guys. <laughs> we didn't bring our PowerPoint presentation. We uh, kind of just got caught up in our last couple weeks of work. Um, but we did obviously do some research, obviously based on what we do. What Amy had brought to us as a challenge to kind of explain to you guys why we do what we do and the things that we do with meat and why we choose to do them. Um, and there's a lot of unknowns for us as well. Um, but before we get into the cooking part of actually the meat, I just wanted to like kind of just jam through some stuff that you guys probably might know as scientists and stuff like that, that, that we didn't know. Um, and can I just chime in? One important thing is that you guys have a homework question based on this lecture, so there's you a couple I really careful. Yes, definitely a couple. Um, so before before it's meat, it's a muscle, um, and to understand you know the muscle structure of animals is 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 very complex, and we can go on just that one subject for the entire class, probably the entire school year for you guys. Um, so actin and myosin are the proteins and muscles that move together or apart needed to contract or relax a muscle. Um, how many of you guys were here for last week for the Nature Miracle lecture? Only one of you guys? Two of you guys? A couple of you guys? <laughs> you guys. <laughs> you um, <don't> count. <laughs> so he, he talked about how muscles are bound together in bundles and like they almost like threads. Um, he has a whole chapter in his book, you know, that's gigantic on it. And you know, the largest bundle itself is the muscle. Um, and that itself kind of is what will show you how to cut a piece of meat or separate its muscles and how the muscles work. Um, meat, meat is uh, the flesh of land animals and birds. Uh, meat is the body tissue that can be eaten as food. Um, uh, <clears throat> an animal's body is specialized to handle the particular physiological demands placed on it during a creature's life. So, Cattle, pigs, lambs, deer, they're all different. You know, like if you walk into a forest, um, Renee might know something, but you see a deer, you startle a deer, it's going to bolt. But how fast it bolts compared to a cow is completely <laughs> different. You know, I mean, the, the muscle structure of venison and, and cattle are completely different. Even though they're somewhat the same in the way they might look and the size is different, their, their textures and their intertwining of those those bundles is, you know, a venison and deer are much leaner of a meat than, than say, cattle. It doesn't move as much. It's not required to move as much, especially when you start talking about how we've decided to breed cattle here in the United States and confining them into small areas. Which, they don't move at all. Yeah, which is not a good thing. Definitely not a good thing. Um, obviously, 
the more our muscles work, the tougher it's gonna be. And more than likely, the longer you're gonna have to cook it. Um, which I, baby animals usually taste better. Which, but which we've also kind of kicked around the, the how the bundles are shortened by cutting um, something or tenderizing it. Um, and tenderness and toughness are textures created by the meat fibers and connective tissues. This is something that is out of your control completely. It's the genetic makeup, the way that you know they were meant to be. Um, so tenderizing before cooking can be achieved in many ways. A couple examples, pounding, cutting, chopping, aging, salting, brining, marinating, grinding. Um, the grinding aspect of it, uh, which I thought was really interesting because, you know, like you could take a pork shoulder, say, for example, and turn that into sausage, which will, you know, read to your mouth as texturally soft, but it really isn't. It's just been broken down. All those fibers have been ground down into now smaller pieces of meat, which you can then chew easier. Um, another another way was slicing it. So like, you know, are many of you guys familiar with Korean barbecue? So like we, we slow roast our pork bellies, that animal, and they almost kind of confit in their own fat. Um, but when you go to Korean barbecue, you usually get raw pork belly just sliced out, at, just sliced it out, and then you put it on a hot grill. And those are just, you know, basic ways of kind of understanding that meat, the more you cut it and the more you break it down, it, the, the quality and the way it's going to taste and textures obviously are going to be different. Um, also, the same thing with making a hamburger. If you take, you know, most hamburgers made from tougher cuts of meat, the like shoulder, brisket, things like that. These are things that we're familiar with, and that's why I'm using these as examples. Um, because you need to understand that if you can't take a brisket and then just, you know, you can't just hack off a piece and just eat it. You can't just sear that. I mean, you could, but it's not going to taste good, more than likely. Um, but if you grind it, it can turn into this delicious, you know, hamburger or cheeseburger. Um, the, uh, the, uh, where was I on this? The hamburger, sorry. <laughs> Obviously, how the animal has been treated in its life before slaughter is another crucial factor in meat quality. Um, and what it's eating. Yeah, yeah, definitely. This is this is something that um, you know we believe in. Um, you know the humane practices of, of you know slaughtering, you know raising and, and breeding animals in the United States is gone in so many different directions and I think there's a lot of people out there right now trying to bring it back into you know these smaller farms you know being more connected with their animals using things that they're as fresh as they possibly can be um, and you know with with the meat going in a few different directions here in the United States it it, it, it poses a lot of problems for us at, at our restaurant because we um, we we really you know pride ourselves on being a meat centric and an inner centric restaurant. These are things that we fell in love with as young cooks, and things that we found the most fascinating as young cooks. Um, and we really felt like Los Angeles kind of had a need for a restaurant of this type. Um, but since Animal started four years ago, um, we've run into a lot of situations where we can't get certain things from the same species, the same animal that we're getting, the short ribs you're gonna to taste today, we're not able to get the hearts of those same animals. Um, so this is something that we've actually been working on for months, is to try to figure out why why can't we get these things? And what it really what we're getting from the answers from our meat purveyors is that on the kill floor, they basically will take these animals and all of the innards or the offal will go to commodity and just because it's not worth their time to sort. There's not enough of a market for even the biggest small producer to, to have enough to sell and there's not enough people out there to buy it. So like we use Nyman Ranch for our 
our bee program, our land program, and our pork program at Animal. Um, and, uh, you know, these situations are kind of tough for us because we really want to be able to serve people the heart of the same animal that we're using, you know, short rib or, the, or you know, the flat iron steak or whatever it may be. It's like we, we find it to be very challenging. The FDA also steps in and there's a lot of regulations on how the meat has to be packed to be transferred to us. So when they go to the slaughterhouse, there's got to be a, actually a middle company in between us and the slaughterhouse before we even get it to the restaurant, which is going to be the distributor. The distributor basically owns no animals at all, which is kind of a weird thing to think that the people you're buying your cattle from or your pigs, they don't own any of the animals. They don't. They probably, most of them haven't even been to the farm, know where it's coming from. We pay extra amount of money to make sure that the people that we're buying from actually at least have their hand in knowing where the pigs are coming from, where the, the cows are coming from. We've been to the farms and seen the way that it's packed and we're still limited on the way that we could get something like a heart. The heart, the tripe, a lot of the innards are really challenging for us to get at our restaurant. And if you can get them, they're frozen. You know, and usually they're frozen, and they were frozen back maybe in 1998. <laughs> you know, and they're so deeply frozen that they're, they take, literally, we got these beef tendons in, and they were so frozen. I, I asked the guy, I was like, man, did you guys go, like, to the back of the freezer to dig those out? Because they took three days to defrost, no bullshit, in the fridge. Like, that's how solid they were. And as cooks, I think we find that to be some of the most fascinating stuff, is to be able to transform these ingredients that, you know, some people might be squeamish about, they, they yuck, gross, disgusting, whatever it may be. Some cultures are raised on this. My grandfather thought it was kind of funny that we had a restaurant that was, you know, innard centric and meat centric because it was basically all the scraps when he was growing up as a kid. And he, my great grandfather was a butcher, and they used. To, he told me that they used to take the wheelbarrow up to the up to the butcher shop and, and bring it home, and that's what they had to eat. So, with that said. Um, you know the corn, the corn diet or corn and grain diet that the cattle that we actually get um, are usually finished on corn and grain, um, which adds to their fat and to the collagen, um, which adds to texture and tenderness in the mouthfeel after it's been cooked, hopefully properly. Um, but there's a whole thing right now going on with grass-fed versus corn and grain-fed. Um, Unfortunately, grass doesn't grow everywhere year-round, and cattle aren't able to graze on grass year-round. So a lot of the new uh, uh, productions that are happening are usually somewhere else outside of the United States. There are a few in the United States, um, not as many as we need to keep up with our demand. Um, so that's and a challenge also as well. a little bit more temperamental when you're cooking a pure grass-fed steak than something that's been corn fed because of the amount of fat. So the fat actually is going to help the cook in majority of the cooks in the United States that cook actually cook on a third grade level. Um, <laughs> in sanitation class, we learned this and it's part of the, you know, food handlers responsibilities in California, the average age of a person that works in a restaurant is third grade. So for us, like we're always trying to put systems in to make sure that the third graders are able to execute the food. Um, and grass-fed is actually going to be a lot more temperamental. you got to have somebody that's going to be a lot more aware and know how to cook a grass-fed steak more so than the corn fed. But meat has always been, you know, the most highly prized food that we eat, specifically because of the energy and the tissue-building protein that, that, it, that it has. Um, this stuff was, you know, pretty essential to evolution for humans. Um, it helped with the enlargement of the brain. Um, later, it was you know obviously used as a source during migration. Um, they were able to you know preserve these meats and, and able to travel with them, um, especially when plant foods were scarce um, in drier climates, you know freezing climates, stuff like that. Um, it obviously also has always been associated with higher class. Meat has always been associated with people of a higher class, they used to, you know, save the meat for the kings and the, the highest of class people in countries uh, throughout the world, um, and still is. Um, did you have a question? Somebody straight there? No. Um, meat is also, you know, obviously a very controversial subject as well. Um, 
it's one of the most widely avoided foods um, for many reasons. Mainly the killing of an animal that feels pain and fear with flesh that resembles our own. Um, are there any vegetarians in here? Anybody? Such is that one of is that one of the reasons <laughs> is that one of the reasons why you don't eat meat? Is it because of or health benefits or um, no. It's uh Right. So there is an emotional value to it for you as well. Well, it doesn't have to do with the animal. It has to do with the worker. Right. Right. Which is a problem. Yeah. Which is a big problem in the United States, especially. Um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> humans, obviously, they they became active hunters about a hundred thousand years ago. These were things that were that were obviously notated in in findings of caves, and they could see drawings and stuff like that where meat was, you know, the prize. Meat was this thing that was, you know, led to strength <coughs> and vitality in the world. Um, and I, I find that to be very interesting, you know, because meat, a lot of times, especially here in the United States, the way we eat it and the amounts that we eat, it's, it's like, you know, there's usually a celebration, you know, there's a lot of times where cultures celebrate around, you know, uh, a cooking of a whole animal or the kill or the hunt. And I, I know one that we've all done, Thanksgiving, right? It's a very common one. Um, <clears throat> the United States makes up approximately a 15th of the world's population. We eat a third of the world's meat. <laughs> I found that to be pretty, pretty amazing. Um, China is rapidly getting closer to our consumption because of its economic uprising. Um, obviously, they're having, you know, a huge uprising in their economic turn, and, and therefore they're adapting some of the Western ways in eating and whatnot, um, which could be a bad thing, um, especially if they start raising, you know, the same animals the same way we do, and, and it could lead to a lot of problems environmentally. Um, I think socially too, health-wise, where you know I think the United States is faced with a lot of you know medical problems nowadays based upon. The amount of consumption of meat that we have, um, many of us today will probably consume more meat than we need to, um, which is not a good thing. Um, <coughs> let's see. Give him the John the weights. Give him the weights. Um, we got. We actually called our our meat provider just so we could give you guys some weights. We have 55 <coughs> seats in Animal. If you guys have ever been there, it's about 600 square, 1600 square feet, about a thousand square foot of dining room. And this is how many pounds of give and do. So we go through. <laughs> so we go through annually. We go through 8,000 pounds of pork belly. We go through 2,800 pounds of pig ears. We go through 1,350 pounds of pig tails. 3,600 pounds of oxtail. 5,200 pounds of ribs. 924 pounds of pork shoulder, which is ground into a sausage, and it's literally like. Barely in the dish, um, <laughs> so you guys can get an understanding of that. 760 pounds of veal tongue, uh, 400 pounds of veal brains, 2,500 pounds of foie gras, <laughs> 2,600 pounds of rabbit, and that's just those are some of our higher scale items. We obviously have a lot more stuff on our menu. Um, and with that said, you know we 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 still you know vegetables are. A, a, major part of what we do there too. We've been, you know, obviously, you know, California and Los Angeles in general, we, we're, we're tied into the farmer's market. It feels like more of a, you know, a responsibility of ours than it does feel like, um, you know, we do it for the sale value. We don't really list the names of the farms that we go through, you know, because we feel like it's a responsibility more than it is something that, you know, we use as a selling point. Um, Go ahead. Uh, what do you intend to do about the foie gras ban? The foie gras ban is actually, we're looking at it like it's kind of a, you know, as the restaurants evolved, you know, we've changed so much. Our cooking's changed. Um, our views on, on so many different, you know, uh, ways about how meat is and our portions and stuff like that have changed. Um, and we're, we're looking at it as part of the evolution. Um, you know, it's sad that we're gonna have to be forced to not use it anymore. Um, 
you know, our, obviously our diners love it. It is part of our business. You know, the, you know, at the end of the day, the restaurant, as as much credit as we've had, and now the, the <coughs> fun as we've had for putting out, you know, delicious food. You know, it's still a business at the end of the day, and hopefully, it doesn't affect our business too much. Is what we're hoping, and we look at it like, you know, this is going to be five new slots on our menu that we're able to open up for new things for our diners to enjoy. Um, so we're not going to break the law. It's a thousand dollars a day. Um, a thousand a dish. Yeah, a thousand, a thousand a dish. dish. So it's pretty steep fine, you know. And, and four hundred dishes. I, I think week. what I think the hard <laughs> I think the hard part is with that. And I, I said this at the the Nathan Maribel lecture was that, you know, I think that this could be just the tip of the iceberg and where they they start to go after niche market products like, let's say caviar, um, uni, another thing, you know, like Santa Barbara spot prawns. They're talking about taking away, you know, wine caught fish, um, which, you know, seems so far fetched to us right now at this very moment, but, you know, before you know it, there's going to be some animal rights activists saying that, you know, we're destroying X and we're taking away X. And, and I hope, now they're, I hope that right now they're after all the low hanging fruit. You know, so all PETA's after is all the low hanging fruit. So, Foie is not a Fortune 500 company like most chickens are in this country. In this country. Like, where we're getting our Foie from, the ducks, the entire duck is used. The quality of the duck, where they're living, the way that they're growing up, is unbelievable compared to the chickens that we're giving our kids in elementary school. But because those chickens are now backed by like a company like Tyson, which is going to produce around 75% of the chickens in the world, they got more money than God to fight these guys, right? <laughs> they really do, you know, and it's like, and then you get into the politics of it, you know, it's like, foie gras, it's like, we get emails from, they've been up in uh, um, San Jose, right, San Jose, going around, Sacramento, Sacramento I mean, going around to these, uh, the, uh, the local politicians and they're asking them about bar and most of them don't even know what it is. You know, so it's like, that's a low hanging fruit for PETA. They're gonna go right after it and we're gonna compete with that, you know? It's, as a business, it gets really tricky for guys like us because we're a small independent business. We're not a Fortune 500, so. The bigger business is gonna affect our people like North Face and Patagonia because those feathers that are in those jackets more than likely come from ducks or geese that probably were raised for for foie gras, um, and you know the that's a, this is a great kind of segue into offal and innards, um, which we know here in the United States more is like variety meat. Um, you hardly ever see it in the grocery stores anywhere, um, which can be frustrating for some people, but it's also kind of become this like. You know, and we've seen this at Animal, it's kind of become like this kind of kamikaze dining kind of thing. And it, it, Probably because of that show, Bizarre Food. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. partially, and I, I, it, you know, it's led to partially the success of our restaurant, you know, because people are, are interested in tasting it and getting those textures. And, and they're, the textures of the innards are nothing like the muscle structure. Um, so you can achieve different tastes and flavors and textures through things like sweetbreads and brains and kidneys and 